uh, Milky Way at Home, which is a physics project from here. And uh, it fits model. The basic thing is it tries to fit models of the Milky Way. Um, I would show you a picture of the Milky Way, but you can't really do that because of lack of warp drive at the current time. So there are two applications right now. One of them I don't understand particularly well, but it does some kind of giant integral of cylinders across. Um, this is like r, like from this is from the sun, and then mu and nu, which are like angles in the sky. Um, and fits some kind of statistical model involving these equations and get some kind of likelihood to fit distributions of stars in tidal streams um, around the Milky Way. And what a tidal stream is, is that the Milky Way has all these like companion dwarf galaxies that are uh, orbiting the Milky Way and getting disrupted by it. And they get ripped apart by um, the tidal forces of the galaxy, which is also, this, which is more explicit in the second application, which is the end body, which this is three at once, and um, three different dwarf models. Um, and what it does is it generates a dwarf model at some point. Now, it, it models the Milky Way as a static background potential, and you place a point, a test particle somewhere at an observed like stream. Then you do a reverse orbit in the potential of the Milky Way and then generate a test dwarf galaxy there and then run it forward in an end body simulation. Then it turns into streams and you can compare those to the observed streams. So what I'm going to mostly talk about now is what I did at the end of last semester and the beginning of winter break before grad school applications destroyed my soul. Um, which was, I, there's this problem where uh, Milky Way at Home is the second largest distributing computing project in the world in terms of flops, or it might be like three right now, because we sometimes lose to like some stupid project that which cracks passwords or something. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the eighty five percent of that is from this API application running on API GPUs, which um, on a fifty eight seventy it takes about ninety seconds to do a work unit, which takes about ten hours on a core two. Um, but the problem is this application was written by some random German guy, and nobody ever got the source from it, and no one got Windows binaries. I don't really know how that happened, but um, he just sort of just, he said he would give people them the source at some point and after he got some postdoc position or something, but then he just disappeared, and now he ignores all attempts to email him or whatever. So now, I meet, last semester, I tried to replace it with OpenCL, which I successfully replaced the CUDA, app, oh, CUDA application with the OpenCL. However, API's implementation of OpenCL is pretty much broken. Um, I was waiting all semester for the stream SDK 2.3 release, which I would hope would fix some of the horrible problems I had, like the compiler just seg faulting constantly. And the change log of things that happened in 2.3 that directly affected me was like incredible. There was like dozens of things that affected me directly, like infinite loop and compiler uses all system memory and things. It was just great. So uh, I gave up on their wonderful OpenCL implementation, which the main problem ended up being after I got everything working with it, was it was too slow. It uses about twice as many registers as it needs to be for no apparent reason, and the IL it generates is just garbage. So now I'm using this sketchy project called Cal++. Uh, it's, some, it's got two parts. One, it's a C++ binding for OpenCL, which I will describe as a cheap ripoff of OpenCL. It's, it's, got, it, it's similar to the OpenCL C++ bindings, but not quite. And it's, the other part is a really terrifying use of C++ templates and operator o overloading. There's like operators, uh, it, it, you write C++ and it turns into ATIL. ATIL is a pseudo assembly for ATI GPUs, which is more compatible to new things. And it's sort of inspired, derived from DirectX assembly. Uh, it uses thousands of lines of C++ templates and side-affecting operators to generate code. It's terrifying. <laughs> like, uh, you make one mistake and like you try to add a float and a double or something without an explicit cast, you have like a 500-line error. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> it was written by one man, but not, not this man, because uh, he writes a certain cube game. Which you dig cubes, yeah. <laughs> um, so well, there are a lot of problems in this sketchy project. My favorite bug that I've had to fix so far in it was 
Well, the ATIIL is really not consistent and the documentation for it is awful. But there are different casting instructions, obviously, like I2F for integer to float or F2I for float integer. Using the word two, however, for some reason, for casting from double to float, they decided to use the number two. And he was generating the instruction to use the word two, and it just failed. The, the ATI, um, the IL compiler, also isn't particularly illuminating in what the errors are, so it takes a long time to find anything that's wrong. So here's a sample of IL. Um, here's a function. This is square root. Because you need this on the Radeon 3000 and 4000, because only the 5000 has a native double person square root instruction. Actually, no, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. You don't need to do this on the 5000. I think there's an instruction. I don't remember, because I want to target the 3000, so I don't care. Um, so then here's like some stuff you have to start it, and then you can declare literals with hex gar garbage. You have to declare your inputs, which are these, like these are images or something. And then this is basically your position in the buffer. You, to keep compatibility with the Radeon 3000 series, you need to use a pixel shader as opposed to the newer compute shaders, which have different things. And this the IL is another layer, and that or an intermediate layer between like Cal plus plus or OpenCL or whatever, and that compiles to the IL. The IL is compatible across different GPUs, but that compiles to this ISA, which is GPU specific. This is for Cypress, which is the 5870. Um, so the main problem with fixing this is it needs to be as fast as the old one, the old API application, because people will reject it otherwise. And here's a um, diagram of Cypress. Um, each of these um, compute units um, have groups of, of API file stream processors, and there's like a shared register pool. Um, I don't remember how many you get, but you to make things fast, you need to hide all of your memory accesses because reading from the GPU memory is really expensive. There's like a 600 to 1,000 nanocycle delay or something like that to read something. So you need a large number of threads to, um, because what it, the whole point of most of this hardware is to swap between different thread groups and you need a lot of them to be able to hide all of the weighting between memory accesses. So you need to do that uh, to support a large number of threads, you need to use as few registers as possible to have as many groups on the shared register pool. So um, that's been the main advantage of our using Calculus Plus directly is it's very low level. You have fine, fine control over the generated IL. So right away I was using about half as many registers and now it's only about 20% slower than it needs to be. But I haven't started playing with that yet because there's still a sl slight problem I need to fix which is, makes the answer wrong. Um, the, the, the results need to be a accurate to within 10th to the negative 12th, but it's broken within 10th to the negative 6th, so there's just some subtle broken thing. I, I run into those once in a while and they're painful to find. So this semester I'm also planning on fixing a bunch of uh, Boink related issues. Boink is the distributed computing platform that Milky Way at Home uses. Um, there are a lot of dumb things, like one thing that really bothers me is how you manage different application versions on both this client and the server. On the server, it, or I guess for both, it depends to target a different like system with different hardware capabilities or different operating system. You have to like hard code all the information to the file name, and it's this really awful system. You, there's no compose. You can you, have, you create what they call a plan class, and to add one of these, you need to modify the the code of the server and like rebuild it and stuff, and it's really terrible. There's no composability. You, like suppose you wanted to have something which uses OpenCL and, or, that's a bad example. So we need one something that uses, uh, requires SSE2 and multiprocessor. You can't do that. You can, there's like predefined stuff to do multiple processors or SSE2, but there's no way to compose them without like recompiling the server and writing code. It's really bad. Um, and on, on the client, you need to, people will want to manage what applications they're running, like for what GPUs or whatever. Um, and if they want to like disable Milky Way at Home on their CPU and stuff, because it's kind of a waste of time, except for the end body, because 90 seconds to do it on the one of these on the 5870 is a lot more time worthy than taking the 10 hours to do the same thing on the CPU. But there's no real way to like manage things on a fine, in a good way. You have to edit an XML file, 
which is the first problem. There's no like interface to do this. And this XML file is white space dependent, I discovered. So like horrible things happen if your white space isn't right. And it's not XML because of that, I guess. But um, questions? <laughs> 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 we, should, we should do Tim's presentation. Okay, Tim. Yeah, okay. I, mine is.